The Lord be with you. And also with you. Okay, so I was at the motorcycle class, motorcycle safety class, and uh, we were having a test. And the first test on uh, a question on the test was, what are three things that are different about riding a motorcycle than riding in a car? You want to know the answer? On a motorcycle, you are vulnerable. On a motorcycle, you have to maintain balance or you will fall over. On a motorcycle, you have to constantly pay attention. You cannot stop paying attention. OK, so there I was in my motorcycle class writing the answers in the margin. And then I realized that's what it means to be missional. <laughs> and so I started writing a parallel set of notes all the way through the class. This was a great metaphor. Because isn't that what it means to be missional? to be God's people called into mission with God, doing the sort of things that Jesus does, doesn't it mean we have to be vulnerable, open, transparent, able to be wounded? That's what vulnerable means, is capable of being wounded. In a car, you've got this big steel cage around you, and you can just run over people and stuff, right? Uh, the bigger and bulkier the car, the more you can run over stuff. You don't, a great big car, you don't have to worry about a hole in the road, you just run over it. <laughs> but I assure you, on a motorcycle, a hole in the road can be the last thing you ever see. So on a motorcycle, you are vulnerable. And you're in touch with the wind and the elements, and, and, and you're in some ways at the mercy of the people around you. On a motorcycle, you have to keep balance or you'll fall over. Now, in a car, you can be out of balance and drive the car. <laughs> but on a motorcycle, you have, to, you have to be in touch with what's happening with gravity and the wind and all kinds of things. And when you go around corners, you have to corner with, you have, you have, to, you have to feel it. You know what I'm saying? And I think about that in terms of the spiritual life the missional life. We have to feel where we're going. We have to be flexible and fluid and bend and cooperate with what's going on around us. And we have to pay attention. You have to know when you're riding your motorcycle, you, you've got to watch the road, you've got to watch the other drivers, you need to, t to watch the, the weather. All these things you have to keep showing up and paying attention. And, isn't that what it means to be a missional Christian? Doesn't it mean being a contemplative Christian who keeps showing up and paying attention and cooperating with God and releasing the outcome? You know, it's risky to ride a motorcycle. It's risky to be a missional Christian. You have to release the outcome. You're not in control. That's the toughest thing for us, to not be in control. And so I was sitting there in the motorcycle class, and I'm looking at the list of the three things. And you know what came to mind is this scripture that we just read, that God has not called the mighty and the powerful and the big that can run over everything in order to do God's deep work in the world. The way of God always has been and always will be to choose that which is small, that which is weak, that which is considered so insignificant as to be nothing in the eyes of the world's economy with the powers. Am I making sense? It is always the way of God to do God's work that way. But we have become deceived. And we think the way of God is mega, supersize, muscle up, command. I've been haunted lately by Isaiah 56. Have you read it lately? There's a strange promise in Isaiah 56 that 
doesn't make a whole lot of sense to our modern ears, so just bear with me while I climb into Isaiah 56 with us. Isaiah 56 is, is a promise of God to all the people who are nothing. <laughs> the promise is this. In my kingdom, says God through Isaiah, don't let the eunuch say, I am but a dry tree. Do you mind if I just talk about eunuchs for a few minutes? <laughs> I, I'm going to talk about literal eunuchs and figurative eunuchs. Can we handle it? I'm going to get a little earthy, all right? In the, in the day of Jesus and in the days of Isaiah and in the days of the writing of these texts, eunuchs were permanently barred from full participation in the faith community. They were not allowed to become part of the, the Jewish priesthood. They were not allowed to even fully go into the place of worship. Eunuchs were not allowed. They were considered permanently unclean, permanently broken. Now, a eunuch was a man who had been taken as a child, sometimes even as an infant, and had been mutilated so that other people could colonize his body and use him to do their will for the rest of his life. A eunuch could not have children. A eunuch had been wounded sexually, colonized sexually to be used by other people for the rest of his life. And out of this sexual wound that, that the boy received when he grew up, he was now considered permanently broken. And it wasn't just in the Jewish community, it was in the surrounding community. This was a universal thing in the days of Isaiah. And coming on into the days of Jesus, it was the same thing. Uh, eunuchs sometimes uh, rose to high positions in the kingdom. For example, Queen Candace, remember the story in the book of Acts? Queen Candace had a eunuch who was her CFO. He had nice clothes, drove a great chariot, got to eat good food, might have even had a pot belly. I don't know. <laughs> he did quite well. But most eunuchs were low-level slaves, chattel property. And because they had been colonized, they were not a threat. So how strange it is to hear this promise, to hear this promise coming through Isaiah. And this is the promise. In my kingdom, don't let the eunuch say, I'm but a dry tree. In my kingdom, the eunuch who follows the Sabbath, who, who loves me and follows the Sabbath, will have a heritage greater than children a permanent heritage in my house. And my house shall be called a house of prayer for the nations. That is the context for that original statement. Did you know that? A promise to eunuchs. People whose lives have been colonized by sin of other people. There are many people around us, survivors of various forms of colonization. Many people around us whose lives were hurt early on in life. And out of those original wounds, I, I you know, I, I believe that sin emerges out of original wounds. I don't believe that a baby is born and is guilty. If you believe that, let's talk afterwards, okay? I do not believe a baby is born guilty. I believe babies are born into a broken world where there are serpents that lie and promise one thing and deliver another. And I believe it's inevitable that a serpent will deceive us. And out of that deception, out of being sinned against, deceived, wounded, exploited, inevitably 
we become sinful out of our coping and responding to this event that has happened. Am I making sense? And so I see the promise to the eunuch as not being just for eunuchs, although it is for eunuchs. <laughs> and that is in itself should blow our minds. But it's for all for whom a eunuch is a type. God's house of prayer for all the nations, you know that word, the nations? The best way for us to interpret that is all kinds of people. All kinds of people with whom I normally would not have traffic. <laughs> All kinds of people I wouldn't know, all kinds of people who wouldn't normally sit at my supper table, people I wouldn't count as friends, people who might even be my natural enemies. All kinds of people are now to be part of my house of prayer, and, and my house of prayer is supposed to be in my house, my house where I live. And it's supposed to be in the house that is God's people. Isn't it something that that amazing promise, that amazing statement, my house will be called a house of prayer for all kinds of people, is given to the eunuchs and through the eunuchs. Because it's the eunuchs in Isaiah 56 who are the, the gathering that creates the environment whereby all kinds of people now are welcome and participate in the prayer. The eunuchs, the people who have been labeled and considered permanently broken, permanently tainted, permanently stained, uncleansable. The small, the weak, those who are considered as nothing. The ancient writer Herodotus writing about eunuchs said this, they are a thing that is not. N-O-U-G-H-T, nothing. Eunuchs in the day of Isaiah, eunuchs in the day of Jesus were shamed. They were labeled. They were called names. They were uh, subjected to all kinds of emotional, psychological, and at times physical abuse because of their sexual ambiguity. They were called a thing of naught. Lucian says that they were alien and monstrous. Just like today, people who have any kind of ambiguity. Because we really like people to fit in our slots, don't we? And anybody who's other is a threat. And isn't this what this text is talking about? That God, who never will cooperate with our colonizing intentions, God inevitably invariably chooses the small, the weak, the foolish, the uneducated, the people with poor grammar and bad teeth, the ones that we think of as nothing, as disposable, as not even quite human, to form the heart of genuine community, a community that loves its neighbors, a community that prays for all kinds of people, even the oppressors. The small, the weak, those who seem to be nothing are vulnerable, transparent, understand the need for balance, being grounded spiritually while moving along, leaning, fluid, flexible, going, and showing up, paying attention, cooperating with God, and of course, releasing the outcome. May God give us the courage to do this. Amen.